Good evening, welcome to our 7.30 meditation tonight, the 24th of March. It's good to have you with us. I wonder, do you have a significant plant or plants in your garden? Or in your mind's eye, if you don't actually have a garden of your own, do you have plants which remind you of people or places or pivotal moments in your life? Donkey's ears, at least that's what my dad called them, were a plant that he grew in his garden at Lambeg, and he took great pleasure in letting his sons have a plant as he shared those around. And they were lovely. They had lovely soft, uh, long drooping leaves, uh, which felt almost like felt or a fur to touch. I think they're called by various names, but that's what my cavern father called them. And I can't ever see plants like it, donkey's ears, without thinking of my dad. I wonder where plants take you in your imagination. Was it a particular flower that you carried in your posy at your wedding? Was it a tree that your parents planted? Was it a favourite bloom that your beloved always wanted to pick and choose for you or for themselves? Or was it the first plant you ever grew from seed? Palm trees and their finger-like branches were evocative in the ancient world. The Egyptians thought the palm branch symbolised life and they would carry them in funeral processions. In ancient Greece, the palm tree was a symbol of victory. So when an athlete won a contest, they were awarded a palm branch. The Romans carried on the practice, so much so that to get a palm meant to gain a victory. For instance, a lawyer who won a case would put palm leaves on his doorway to show people he had won his latest day in court. I usually associate palm trees with the ones that grow coconuts on desert islands. But the palms of Judea were probably smaller, palms that grew dates, and the source of those small, rich and tasty fruits were plentiful in the country. It was so famous for them that the palm was used as a symbol of Judea, the same way we might have Britannia on a British coin. The Romans put a palm leaf on a Jewish coin. It's not surprising then that the Jews who celebrated the arrival of their king, King Jesus, would greet him with signs of victory and triumph as he entered the city in suitably humble style. Matthew, Mark and Luke tell us of the branches, but only John mentions that they are palm branches. Mind you, if you were to try and spread tiny olive tree branches on the road or fig tree branches, the other trees that were popular in Jerusalem, it would take a long time to make some sort of carpet for King Jesus to walk along. It would make a very poor show. Reading from John chapter 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. In the Revelation to St John, the palms appear again. Revelation 7 from verse 9. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The same disciple, John, wrote both the Gospel 
and Revelation. And judging by his grasp of Roman life in both books, he knew why the palm was so important. It was a symbol of victory, the victory of Jesus Christ. Symbols are very important, partly because of the symbol itself, but more so because of what they represent. There was talk in the newspapers in the last week about the use of a Union flag and of a picture of the Queen during an interview on television. It seems like the interviewee thought it enhanced his importance, while the interviewers poked fun at him, I think, for his use of these symbols to help him look important. It was probably all in bad taste. But it looked to me like teasing a Tory, he happened to be a Tory, rather than mocking a nation. But symbols mean a lot, whether they are used appropriately or not. I have a mixed view about the symbols. I'm cautious about treating them as if they embody what they stand for. In the world of the church, if we treat consecrated bread and wine as if their physical presence was identical to Jesus' body, then we risk becoming idol makers each time we celebrate communion. Now, we should treat the bread and wine with the utmost respect, but probably not in a fastidious or fussy way. On the other hand, if we treat a sacred symbol, whether sacred to us or to an opponent, as a thing to be mocked or abused, then we've done ourselves or our opponents a great disservice. I wonder what you have done with the palm crosses you received at church during some former year. Do you treat them as more than a piece of an African leaf you were given by a friend? Has it become an object it would be a sin to destroy? If so, there's a risk that it is more than a symbol to you. As I look in people's homes, I quite often will see a palm cross which has been given to them some Palm Sunday back in St Ignatius or in St Andrews, and it's been there for years. It's been sitting up on a wall, stuck behind a picture or even hanging on a nail, and there it is gathering dust. For others, it has probably just lasted a week before it got tossed. One of the traditions in some churches is that the old palm crosses were brought back to the church on the weeks before Lent on the following year, and those very crosses were burnt to create ashes for Ash Wednesday. That at least would make the palm crosses a spur to some religious activity, rather than a way of gathering little artefacts for no great, great gain and at some moderate risk. On Sunday's drive-ins, we will all receive palm crosses. I wonder what you will do with yours this year. For us, I suspect they will go on a board we keep in the kitchen. It used to be there to keep tickets for trips to the theatre in the days long ago when we were allowed to go out to the theatre. But later in the year, they will join the recycling box. They certainly won't still be there in several years' time. They need to be dealt with, don't they? For our prayers this evening, we will use a short litany from the prayer book. It's on page 175 and just an excerpt from it. God the Father, have mercy on us. God the Son, have mercy on us. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. We humbly pray that you will hear us, good Lord. Grant to your people the forgiveness of sins, growth in grace, and the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, hear our prayer. Send your peace to the world, which you have reconciled to yourself by the ministry of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, hear our prayer. Heal the divisions of your church, that all may be one, so that the world may believe. Lord, 
hear our prayer. Lead the members of your church in their vocation and ministry, that they may serve you in true and godly living. Lord, hear our prayer. Raise up faithful and able ministers for your church, that the gospel may be known to all people. Lord, hear our prayer. Fill those pastors with compassion, clothe them with humility, and move them to care for all your people. Lord, hear our prayer. Inspire all bishops, priests, and deacons, all who minister in your name, with your love, that with all your people they may hunger for truth. Lord, hear our prayer. Bless your servants, all recently and soon to be admitted to the order of deacon. Pour your grace upon them, that they may faithfully fulfil the duties of their ministries. Build up your church and glorify your name. Lord, hear our prayer. Sustain by the indwelling of your Holy Spirit all who are called to the ordained ministries of your church and encourage them to persevere to the end. Lord, hear our prayer. Gather us with all your saints into your eternal kingdom. Lord, hear our prayer. And we join together in the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Eternal God and Father, you have promised to hear those who pray in the name of your Son. Grant that what we have asked in faith, we may obtain according to your will, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And together we pray, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you for joining with me this evening. We're having a Zoom prayer time just after it this week. Please uh, be ready for, to start around about five past eight uh, when I hope I'll be back in time from a wedding rehearsal to do that uh, with you. See you in 15 minutes or so. Thank you.